Six cooks, <laughs> six countries, six incredible journeys. <laughs> Stepping outside their comfort zones. It's not for the faint-hearted, for sure. Our cooks will travel far and wide. Route 7 all the way. To find some of the most exciting food on the planet. If you're back in the UK, you've got tandoori chicken. Nothing like this. It's beautiful. This is the best food I've had in Egypt. It's pure, it's got heritage. It's got love in it, you know. They'll go off the beaten track. Crocodile. Crocodile sausages. Meeting extraordinary people. Exploring ways of life unchanged for centuries. No electric blenders in the jungle. Have to do everything by hand. Take your life into your own hands. You're on the road now. As they travel, they'll see how the language of food transcends cultural differences. I've never hoofed on a cheese before. <laughs> and a world away from home. This is why I love Australia. There's no excuse for a bad pie in Australia. This is the beginning. Where do we end? They'll learn lessons that could change the way we cook forever. I've been cooking a barbecue wrongly all my life. Wow. This time, top chef Monica Galetti heads to France. How's that for a view to arrive to, huh? In search of the origins of the world-class produce she uses every day. That's exactly what goes around the Mont d'Or and gives it that unique flavor. She'll learn to live off the land. This is like a natural candy store. And from the romance to the reality. It's running for its life. She'll discover the incredible way of life at the heart of French cuisine. I can do a bit more of this. I think I need a bit more of this. Andy, when you get a minute, just get these on the tray in, in the fridge, yeah? This is me in a nutshell, cooking her cuisine in a high-end restaurant. I moved here from New Zealand 15 years ago, starting on the bottom rung and working my way up to become senior sous chef. This kitchen is my life, and it's where I met my husband. How many wines are you having? Six different wines. Six different. Yeah, two wines. David is the head sommelier here. That's pretty much how much time we get together here. Um, I won't see him until tomorrow morning again, because he's here most of the time, and I'll go pick up our daughter in the evenings. That's why it works. <laughs> As a chef, especially when you're in a high-end restaurant, you're quite spoiled with a variety of amazing ingredients that are available to us. We get the best of the best here. You've never tried a mondo? All right. Today's your lucky day. Working flat out, I've never had the chance to spend time in the field finding out how all this incredible produce is made. But that's about to change. To get out there and then to really be a part of the producers that are behind the scenes of these amazing ingredients that we get. And getting my hands dirty, I'm really looking forward to it and I'm really excited. Everyone runs away from me. Backing me all the way is my friend and boss, Michelle Rue Jr. You ready for your trip? I'm always ready. We here in the kitchen are just looking at that very, very end product. But you know, you're going to see the passion and respect that goes into it. Although, he does seem to have an ulterior motive. Promise to bring me back a piece of Conte. Yeah. And a bottle of wine to go with it. That's asking a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> My journey to meet these world-class producers is taking me to one of the least explored regions of France, the Jura Mountains. The mountains run along the French-Swiss border, and the Alpine way of life is influenced by both countries. The people have a reputation for being self-sufficient and fiercely independent. This is where some of my favorite produce comes from, particularly cheeses like Mondor and the world-famous Conte. There's also another connection that brings me to the area. It's where my husband is from. Uh, he's grown up in this area, so we spend a lot of time coming back here it, but it's where we come back to recuperate, to recharge the batteries, you know, getting away from London life. 
So I'm really excited now that I've got this opportunity to really get in there and, and, and see what it's all about finally. But before I head for the hills, I have a stop to make. I'd never be forgiven for not popping in to see my mother-in-law, Betty, at the lingerie shop she manages. Coucou. Bonjour. <laughs> Ça va? Ça va, et toi, ma chérie? Mm. 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 Tu vas bien? Ouais, yeah. super, super. Un peu fatiguée, mais ça va. Tu es contente? Super. Ouais, je suis ça contente. Tu as le soleil, là, c'est bien. C'est la chance, hein? hein? C'est la chance. Très non. bien. Alors, tu es prêt pour un café? Oui. Ouais, tu oui. es content? Oui. oui, on oui. y va? Pas de souci. OK. Tu aimes, hein, la tarte au sucre? J'adore, hein? C'est bon, ouais, hein? Ouais, ouais. Ouais. Comme ça. Mm. Je pense qu'avec tout ça, là, tu vas avoir un peu plus de, de jurassien dans. En quoi Pensez jurassien un petit peu. À les, toutes les choses typiques euh, du coin. Ouais. Il a pas de soleil maintenant. Sitting around eating cake isn't going to make me more jurassien. Time to pull on my gumboots and head for the mountains. It's autumn and everywhere is a hive of activity as communities hunker down for the harsh winter ahead. My route takes me through wine country. It's October, harvest time. This is what it's all about. Oh, so lucky to be here. I've got to take a selfie just so I can wind up my husband. <laughs> The most famous wine in the Jura is called Vin Jaune, or yellow wine, and it's beginning to make waves back in the UK. I've got strict instructions not to come home empty-handed, so I'm stopping at my mother-in-law's favorite producer to stock up. Enchanté, Jean-Paul, ça va? Oh, je fais la bise, là. Van Jean is made from the white Sauvignon grape, a key component of its appellation de origine contrôlée, or AOC. As well as being a guarantee of quality, the AOC is linked to the place where something is made, as it's believed that the terrain itself, or terroir, gives a product its unique qualities. Jean-Paul is kind enough to show me his cellar. Wow, look at this. I've been to, to some cellars, but they've all been quite modern, you know, they've all been uh, kept up to date. This is his own personal cellar. You can look at how damp it is here, you know, the mould along the barrels. I feel quite honoured to be able to, to come in here. It's a magnifique ici. Ah, oh, yeah. Oui. Ouais, c'est... Il y a beaucoup d'années. <laughs> so, yeah, but there's a lot of spiders. They do their work too. Yes, and uh, a lot of work. Oh, wow. Jean-Paul wants to show me what makes Van Jones special. A layer of yeast that forms naturally in the surface while in the barrel. This is what gives it its unique taste. I don't know if you have power. Look at that. You have to have a gris like that. Yes. When it's too thick and it's not good. This veil of yeast also gives the wine its distinctive appearance. Look at the colour of that beautiful Van Jaune. You know, that's where it gets its name from. It's yellow, golden wine. And, and the older it is, the, the more yellow in colour. This barrel that uh, Jean-Paul has just drawn the wine from is from 2005. So you can see the intensity and, and the beautiful golden colour in that. Mais santé. Santé. On tasting it, it's very smooth, very similar to to sherry. There's a strong earthiness that comes through the wine. It is, for me, an acquired taste because I am not from the region. But now that I'm used to drinking this, personally, I'd, I'd happily take the barrel. Mais bon ça, je j'emmène avec moi. Tu emmènes avec moi, ça? Oh, ben, pourquoi pas? Tu veux prendre ta commune? You'll let me take the barrel. <laughs> mm. 
Jean-Paul's approach epitomizes what I am hoping to find here, a care and attention in everything he does and a real connection to the land, the idea of Tewa brought to life. Merci beaucoup. C'est la chance, hein? J'ai un bon cadeau. Je fais la bise. À bientôt. À bientôt. <laughs> this peak is Mondor. It defines both the landscape and the produce that comes from here. It's dairy country. There are cows everywhere, and their milk is used almost exclusively to make cheese, including some of my favorites. It's mid-October, freezing temperatures and snow are just around the corner. So the cattle are brought down from the mountain pastures to spend the winter in barns. At this time of year, people from all over the area come together to celebrate their farming heritage at a festival called a Kamis. There's one happening tomorrow and preparations appear to be in full swing. Lots of Christmas trees with decorations on them. They're everywhere. <laughs> Nearly half of the working population up here is employed in a dairy industry, and most villagers have their own specialist cheese shop. That is a big cheese. Combien de kilo? 35 à 40. 35 à 40. Right. This wheel that you can see here, it's about 35 to 40 kilos of Comté. I think Michel uh, would have a hard time getting through that if I was to take him a piece. <laughs> Merci. Sylvie's pulling out the region's big guns for me to taste, starting with the world famous Conte. Like some wines, Conte has appellation de origine contrôlée, or AOC status, which requires the cheese to be aged in a cold cellar for up to two years. Ah. Voilà. Il a 15 mois. Delicious. Anything less than 15 months is a sort of, to them, you know, not a, a, a good quality. It's still very good, but it's, it's fine that the, the children like it more because it gets quite salty uh, the older the, 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 the Conte becomes. You get these salt crystals forming in there, which personally I love. In the UK, what, what I would find sort of quite similar comparison to this is an aged cheddar. Next is a Morbier, another AOC cheese. The, the Morbier is a semi-hard cheese. Unlike the, the Conte, it's, it's not as hard, it's much softer. Mm. But this one has got such a soft um, texture. It's got a lot of flavour. Finally, a Bleu de Gex. It is quite strong for some, if some people are not used to, to blue cheese, they might find this a, a strong one. Personally, I love it. I would think, compare it to, to, to a good Stilton. Wonderful Stilton. Vous connaissez Stilton? No. Oh. I'm quite offended that she doesn't know what Stilton is. Ne jamais goûté de fromage des Anglaises? No, pas. No? À part euh, le, le cheddar. Oh, mais c'est pas possible. C'est là. Non, c'est. De juste le cheddar. On a beaucoup de bons fromages à donner. Ah, je pense. Sylvie's told me that these three cheeses have one thing in common. They were all made from the milk of one type of cow. This is the Montbelliard, a cow first bred in this area and perfectly equipped to live in the mountains. It's thanks to this animal that the community makes a living. Tomorrow's festival will pay homage to this breed. And it'll be the perfect way for me to explore the way of life up here. It's 5.30 a.m. on Julien Le Toublon's dairy farm, and it's freezing. Bonjour. All hands are on deck, with friends and family helping him prepare for today's camis. But Julien is up to his elbows elsewhere. 
He's a 10th generation farmer who has lived and breathed Montbelliard cows his entire life. That's so beautiful, no? Oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. Claire Guillon is a cow osteopath and knows the Montbelliard breed well. In the winter here, we've got one meter of snow, so they have to stay inside and you give them uh, hay. Cheese made in winter or cheese made in summer is different. Definitely, you can yeah, yeah, feed, yeah. taste it on the cheese. Yeah. Julian's herd is small enough for him to know each animal as an individual, as well as their family trees. There's nothing like milk straight from the farm. But this milk's not normally for drinking. It's used exclusively to make Conte. Oh, it's amazing. So creamy, so delicious, sir. Yeah? Oh, my goodness. Julian is taking 14 of his best dairy cows down to the festival. The main event will be a beauty contest, a sort of cross for cows where prizes are given for the best examples of the Montbelliard breed. Down at the festival site, some other farmers have the drop on us and have already started scrubbing up their cows. It's just another sign of the dedication these people have. Absolutely incredible the amount of people that have turned up before sunrise. Uh, to help their friends and family to get all the cows prepared. Julien has put Claire and I in charge of washing down his prized cow, Radine. So you go and you wash everything. So you start in the front, you have to do the legs. Well, it's one way to keep warm at least. Yeah. He's very brave. I wouldn't go up that close uh, to the back end. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> The final touch is a good luck charm. C'est la cochon la petite fille. Oui. C'est ta petite fille. Louise. This particular bell is the one Julian bought for his daughter's uh, baptism. Uh, we normally buy like a, sp a spoon or something. His daughter gets a big, massive bell and uh, it's going on our cow for today's competition. Good way. So, what does it take to be crowned a cow beauty queen? Usually they judge the back, like they have to be a strong and like a flat back. And then you judge as well a lot about the pelvis. Yeah. It has to be really large. You can see all of them are like really large pelvis. Right, so it's very important having a big booty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely you know? bigger than that one. Yeah. And then the judge, the tits as well, like to be the four of them going down. Yeah, very to... natural looking tits, not, yeah. uh, not uh, deformed. <laughs> yeah. This is a very awkward conversation. <laughs> and, yeah, like useful to put the, the milking machine. Yeah, to attach yeah. The, 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 the milking uh, That's really important. I can feel the excitement building across the showground, and I've been told the preparations for the commis take eight months. But the commis is like a really festive day, and yeah. everyone is like, yes, we're going to go with all the farmers. It's a free day for all of us, yeah. showing yeah. our cows, having fun together. But this is France, so nothing can begin until everyone has had a sit-down meal. What a great way to start the morning with a hot soup. In here was chestnuts and bacon, and they poured a hot, creamy pumpkin soup on top. It smells delicious. Mm. And my baguette, of course. My cheese. <laughs> and let's not forget my wine. Normal breakfast at this time. Allez, santé, hein? <laughs> With everyone fueled for the day ahead, the serious business of judging can begin.
Radine sails through to her group final and Julien's father takes over to parade her around the ring. Because it was him who got uh, Radine when she was first born. So you can see the excitement. They're so proud that, you know, it's their animal. So they made the first selection. So it's really exciting for us to have our cow inside this already. OK. In that, they're going to make another selection and put them all next to each other, from the best to the worst. They have to make rings and sometimes stop that they can see the So they're just looking at all of them as they yeah. walk and still yeah. judging now. Yeah. Well, we've made it down to the final three. And uh, Claire and I think it's because it's all due to our hard work of uh, cleaning uh, Radine up this morning. <laughs> After much rumination, Radine gets third prize. Not bad for a 15 year old. This Camis will be the last chance for villagers to come together before the winter. And of course, a local specialty is on the lunch menu. Much like tartar flat that you find in the Alps, local chef Michel is making morbi flat, a dish made with morbia cheese. C'est la recette typique de la région. Euh, on avait le fromage, les pommes de terre venaient du jardin, des oignons, le lard du cochon de la ferme. Donc avec les éléments de la ferme, on arrivait à faire un plat consistant qui tient au corps, surtout l'hiver. He's kicking off his third batch of the day and we're already under pressure as front of house have run out. With 500 people to cook for, this is a world away from the haute cuisine I'm used to. Wow. Normally everything is prepared and they're in containers, but we would not cook, you know, one big batch in, in, in one go. This is impressive. First, onions and bacon. So we're just cooking it down, sweating it down with the, with the bacon until the onions are, are translucent. To... Now we're adding 16 kilos of uh, potatoes. In goes some white wine and cream. And it's seasoned with nutmeg and herb de Provence. And then, of course, the, the morbier, where it gets its name from, the cheese that he's adding in now. Michelle seems to be feeling the pressure. I know what that's like. Madame, Monsieur, uh, the chef me dit, I've just five minutes to make fondue de fromage. Désolé, five minutes. Allez, dépêchez-vous. Désolé, pardon, merci. The production line has ground to a halt. And not a moment too soon, the morbi flat is ready. It's pretty quick. 60 portions in, what, under 20 minutes, cooking that much? It's not bad going. OK. OK. Et voilà. Place avec vous, madame. <laughs> it's a great thing to do in winter, you know, coming home from work, you know, knock back together and sit down as a family and have it as a meal. It is absolutely delicious. The, the, the Morbier Mountain Dew with bacon. The two lovely ladies have said it's absolutely delicious. Um, but they said that the sausage, however, is too hard. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't cook that. <laughs> Today has given me a privileged glimpse inside a rural community, a world away from my life in London. The farmers here are totally dedicated to producing milk for a whole range of AOC cheeses. This isn't a job, it's a way of life. For Julianne, there was one last tradition of the day, a fondue to thank everyone who's helped out. There are different recipes for this all over France, but for Julianne's family, it's simple. Garlic, local wine, and of course, lots of Conte. A kilo de Conte, five people. 
Un kilo pour cinq personnes. Deux cents grammes par personne. Non. No, in the French, there'll be a cheese course after this as well. <laughs> this is a very special meal for everyone here, and not just because of the commis. It's the end of summer, coming to autumn, and, and it's very rare for them to then have the opportunity to get together in the winter before the snow won't be far away, and it's a hard time for them. He doesn't want to think about that. He wants to have everyone here together now while they can to celebrate. <laughs> The coming of winter is where most things around here shut down. But it's also where one of my favorite cheeses starts being produced, Mondor. Unlike Conte, Mondor is a seasonal cheese made when the cows are kept inside and fed on hay. It has an unmistakable taste of the alpine forest that comes from a thin strap of wood wrapped around the cheese. But the strap can't be made from any old wood. It has to be spruce. The straps are called sangles. Bonjour. Bonjour. And the Bonjour. people who make them are known as sangliers. Enchanté, Yvon, je suis Monique. Enchanté. Tu bois café? Oui? Oui, un peu. Pas trop, mais oui, je prends un peu. I've eaten Mondor for years without giving a second thought to the people who produce the wooden straps that make it so special. Moins 7, pas plus. Can be minus 7, and he's out there stripping this tree down, you know, in the, in, in the winter, you know, with snow and, and everything as well, and he's doing it all year long. That's some hard going. On y va? On y va. Yvon is one of around 50 sangliers left in the region, and one of the few who will carry on through the coming winter. Yvonne works alongside woodcutters like Guillaume, who lets him cut straps from spruce trees he's felled. No money changes hands, but Yvonne makes sure they are rewarded. You do that all the time? You do the fire like that all the time? Often on Sunday. On Sunday? Yes. Okay. To thank the bûcherons for having found the wood. And then it's a way to meet a little bit and eat together. That's good, that. They're coming to take their casse-croûtes and then... Yes, the casse-croûtes together, my friends. Thank you. While the fire burns down, Yvon gets to work slicing off the bark. This reveals a layer of the trunk called phloem, the part of the tree that transports sap. A special tool called a spoon is used to cut the straps. Ebon can cut 300 perfect straps an hour. My turn now. Not bad. And there we have it. That's exactly what goes around the Mondor and gives it that, that special, unique flavor to, to the cheese. Several things about Mondor are regulated under its AOC, such as where the cheese can be produced. This protects the cheese makers from outside competition. But the spruce straps can come from anywhere, leaving the local sanglier exposed. Like that. How uh, many can be sold? We sell 35 centimes. Yes. They are fabricated in the region. The competitors who come from the West, they are at 25. Ah, but okay. 10 centimes more. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yes. Without the protection provided by AOC status, this ancient profession could die out here. Manger quelque chose que tu n'as jamais mangé, que je t'ai préparé, c'est une cuisse de chevreuil que j'ai coupée en tranches, que j'ai fait mariner et qu'on va piquer au cognac. We've got uh, quite an impressive uh, cook amongst us here. 
Tu me diras si c'est bon. Oui, hein. Before this, uh, Yvon has marinated the venison in uh, herbes de Provence, uh, the olive oil and uh, mustard. I love this. <laughs> I've never injected meat like the way he's doing it. This is exactly the kind of uncomplicated food I was hoping to find in the mountains here. Do you think they'll let me do this in Hyde Park? <laughs> bon appétit. Bon appétit, merci. Bon appétit. That is just delicious. You know, that cognac, he's injected in there. It can really, it's got such a fresh hit in there. You know, it's not like when you deglaze or, or pour a sauce into a pan and then the alcohol evaporates. It's actually in the meat. You, you can taste it. And his marinade, you can taste the mustard uh, on this. And it's really well seasoned. You know, the salt that comes through this, absolutely delicious. No better way to have this than, uh, you know, on a barbecue out in, in, in nowhere. I think she, I like to insist that I only eat my meat like this. <laughs> Any young chef that needs to really get in touch with what they do, this is where it begins. To discover what the produce is about, where it comes from. I'm surrounded by it, you know, uh, what we're eating. To meet the, the suppliers, the artisans, the the, to, to see the, the craftsmen in their surroundings at their best. They're very humbling people to be amongst as to the reality of being at the other end of, of cooking these high-end products, serving it in, in high-end restaurants. It is right here. This is it. After seeing the dedication of the sanglier and passion of the milk producers, I want to know how these elements come together to make the finished mondor. Looks like they won a few prizes, huh? This is Henri Marmet, who works on a family-run dairy farm. Oui, il est parfait. J'y vais, j'y vais comme ça. Mais tu vois les différences, hein? C'est ça? Oui. Every morning, his parents and sister milk the family cows. I've arrived just at the point when the milk has solidified and is being separated into the solid curds and liquid whey. He's a true artisan cheesemaker, which involves keeping a keen eye on the weather. If it's cold, if it's cold, if there's humidity in the air, so you have to really be around the cuve and then adapt a little bit the fabrication in function of the evolution of the grain. Okay, okay. You know, there's no rush in his work here. Everything is, is, is on site. He's touching and he's feeling the, the cheese. You know, there's no carelessness here. On a ici à la ferme des, des gens qui viennent acheter directement leur fromage. Et ils, sont, ils arrivent à faire le lien entre l'agriculture, l'élevage, la production du lait, la fromagerie, la commercialisation. Il y a un lien direct entre ce qu'ils vont acheter et puis ce qu'ils ont vu. Et ça, je trouve que c'est vraiment une image super. For me, I, I can relate exactly to how Henri feels. You know, it's that, that drive to create something uh, and then sell it on or to give people the, the pleasure of, of what you've made. Henri's years of experience build up to one moment each day. Knowing the exact point when the curds are ready to make mondo. Very soft, jelly-like, and it tastes like a very fragile, very, very light yogurt. Um, and it's now into the mold, and it's draining off. The curds rest in the mold for a couple of hours, allowing the whey to drain off and the cheese to compress. After which, they're wrapped in the spruce straps. You know, the passion, the drive that, that gets these people up in the morning, for me, it's, it's just, uh, it's amazing. I'm in awe, in absolute awe, and in uh, the chapeau, a hat off to them. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> Entrez, Monica. 
Tasting the first mondo of the year is always a special moment. Henri's mother has one of their first batches of the season for me to try. Bonjour, ça va? Le papa. Papa? Je suis Monica. Bonjour, Monica. Around here, wherever there's cheese, there's going to be wine. You can see uh, the, the, the curves and, and, and the, the ruffles through the Mondo. And it, it, they say it's, it's, it's meant to like, symbolize or emulate uh, the mountains around us. On y va? Mais vous aussi? It's very early in the season and it's very clear because it's much lighter. Yes, it's very creamy still, uh, but the taste is, is, is very light. It hasn't got that, that, that sort of richness and, and that, that woody, the strong woody taste coming through yet. It's absolutely delicious, but I think come the Christmas period, this is going to be at its best. Santé. Santé. Merci encore. Santé. At the restaurants, I cook a lot of meat and always look forward to autumn when the game season kicks in. But I think that if you eat meat, you've got to face up to where it comes from. Hunting is part of everyday life here. And before I left, Chef Michel said that this is something I should experience. So I'm taking his advice and going on a boar hunt. I'm a bit anxious to, to see what happens when it's being caught and that I don't know what my, my reaction would be to that. For me, I, I'd, I'd pretty much give anything a go and then I'll decide whether I'd do it again. Bonjour. Bonjour Monica, vous allez bien? Oui, super. Francois Dole is master of the hunt. His family have been breeding hunting dogs for three generations and a key part of his enterprise here involves raising their own boars. These are released into a large but enclosed area so the dogs can be trained to pick up a scent and track the boar. This way, there's no impact on the wild population. Aujourd'hui, ces gens-là sont venus pour on est en début de saison, ils sont venus là pour entraîner leurs chiens. People from all walks of life bring their dogs here. Today there's a butcher, some farmers and a builder. Francois's sister-in-law Marion also hunts regularly. I wasn't expecting to see mm. uh, any women here, just uh, a lot of the men. Uh, obviously, majority are men here. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's the, what the ratio of, of women that do hunting now? In this department, there is 8,000 this year, 8,000 person uh, asking for the license, and 600 are women. Wow. So each year, it's more and more. The women, they're hunting as well with dogs like this, with guns, or they are doing the chasse à cour, so with horses or bicycle, all depends. Usually there is a lot of women practicing this because they can come with kids and they can ride a horse and there is no guns used. The, the dogs have to catch the, the deer or the boar or the rabbit. They're excited, huh? They want to get out there. Like the hunters, the dogs come in different shapes and sizes. Today, there are no guns unlike most hunting or stalking in Britain. The dogs will bring the board down and then a hunter will dispatch it quickly with a knife. After only 10 minutes, the pack are onto something. There are chiens qui se récrient un petit peu, des chiens qui ont connaissance de la voix et qui, quand ils ont connaissance de la voix, le chien cherche et donne de la voix. Il se récrient, il se récrient. Et là, apparemment, il y a des connaissances. I haven't seen it yet, but the hunters have caught sight of the boar. Apparently, it's a good size. So they're just talking about uh, the, the wild boar they've spotted. It's, 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 uh, they say it's a beautiful black one. Uh, I think so, 65, 65 kilo, maybe. Uh, and he's saying it's got a very big head on it. <laughs> Doing different things. Yeah. Who's he? Uh, uh, racing. Yeah. Yeah. We're coming very close. Yeah, we can... Whoop. There we go. Here you can see the ball. Oh, they've got it. Oh, no. I'm actually finding it quite um, emotional, you know, to see an animal being chased down. 
I, I'm, I'm a bit torn here because uh, I mean, being a part of this hunt is exciting, but I don't like watching an animal being chased down. So, you know, for me, it is getting quite emotional. And uh, I don't know how, you know, I really don't like that side of it. It's running for its life. It's running for its life from us, from the dogs. I'm not prepared for that. The harsh reality of, of, of hunting, isn't it? The boar is beginning to tire and the pack is getting close to bringing it down. As soon as this happens, one of the hunters would dispatch it with a knife. The boar has been caught in some woods. It's still alive when I get there. No. Thankfully, it's over in seconds. You know, the, the, the chase and the, the adrenaline of the excitement, you're caught up in the excitement of the dogs and the hunters until you, I get here and then and he's down. Wow. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's not for the faint-hearted, for sure. You know, and to, to see someone, you know, kill an animal. I'm, I'm just pleased that they had him down in such a way that it only took one, uh, one stab and, and it was gone. It's traditional for the hunters to pay their respects to the animal and the land that produced it. Boys taken back to the lodge to be butchered. I've handled a, a, a dead wild boar before, but never warm like this. It's so warm, and it, you know, handling it like that is different. You know, it just reminds you that uh, it was alive just a moment ago. The, the, this connection I never had is, is so real here. Almost to, 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 to do this, I've got to like go into it quite cold, you know, to, to the, try and get that emotional out of the way I can't, I, I, you know, I need to sort of block it. It's a danger factor here because the, the, the innards, the offal, is, is the first part that's going to go off and it gets quite dangerous. So we want to remove this offal now. <sighs> Only kind of hot meat I touch is when it's being cooked. Stop. Stop. Each hunter will get part of the carcass to take home. Nothing is wasted. It's lunchtime, back in my comfort zone. I'm helping Frank cook the liver. It'll be the highlight of the meal for a bunch of hungry hunters. Pig liver, I find, can be quite strong, very intense and, and heavy. I mean, this is a boar, so you can imagine it's even stronger in, in, in taste. I, I personally wouldn't want to eat this very pink. I would probably have it a little bit more cooked, so more on the, on the medium side. But uh, he's also going to do what's called a pessier here, which is very classic French, garlic, shallot, and parsley. Bon? Encore une. Encore une, là. Encore une. Ouais. Voilà. Alors. I don't think this is going to take very long because you can see the, the, the liver's been cut quite thin. Got... Then comes a healthy dose of wine, from the Jura, of course. Voilà. You're bien réduit? Right. Uh, so you let this to, to reduce a little bit. I'm not a fan of well-done liver normally. I would have it sort of pink uh, or sort of medium. Um, so I hope I like this. 
The last things to add are some cream and mustard. This is simple rustic fare. Wow. You can see it. This is now incorporating uh, to make a beautiful creamy sauce there. This, for me, is very classic ingredients in a way of cooking. I love the, the flavors that Frank is using. Et voilà. Oh, attention, ça fait chaud, hein? It's, it's, it's an amazing texture, fresh like that. I've never had it so fresh. So I completely agree with Frank. It has to be well done because the texture is, is, is still quite tender. And I can imagine if it was cooked any less, it, it wouldn't be pleasant to sort of chew on, on a liver like that. And it's very important to cut it as thin as, as Frank prepared the, the liver with that creamy sauce, uh, the garlic. I don't mind big chunks of garlic. I love garlic but I'm going to get into it and finish mine. I get it now. I completely get it. I would absolutely tear into one of my lads if I got this in my kitchen and they were to waste something or disrespect it in any way, more so than I normally am, and I can be quite harsh in the kitchen. You know, would I, would I come back again and do it again? I, I, I can't answer that right now. Although I had my qualms, I can see how important hunting is to people here. It's a way for them to stay connected to their land and their culture. Plus, they know exactly where their meat comes from. I've been struck by how everyone I've met on this trip is passionate about producing and eating excellent local ingredients. But, it seems that some people are taking this a step further, trying to be self-sufficient and to live a traditional Jurassian way of life. I've heard about a man who lives at Mondo itself and who is trying to do just that. He spends the summers on the mountain, but, like the cows, comes down when winter begins to bite. This is his last week up here. How's that for a view to arrive to, huh? Hello, Nobert. Monica. Oui, c'est Monica. Enchantée, j'ai fait la bise. Ah. Comment allez-vous? Bien, merci. Oui. Merci bien. Un petit uh, cadeau. Cadeau. Wow. Uh, des joueurs. D'accord. C'est le meilleur. Le bon d'or. Super. Nobert Bonnet runs a hostel for hikers near the Swiss border. There's no running water or mains electricity, but I hear there's no shortage of delicious things to eat. Avec Monica. Oui, d'accord. <laughs> <laughs> On y va. Allez, mon kiki. Comment s'appelle? Libellule. Libellule. Comment ouais. libellule? He's planning to make a hearty soup for supper, but we need to forage for the ingredients. This is such a treat. A chef to get the time out in the country like this, but for someone like uh, Norbert to, to show you where to go and pick your own mushrooms, he picks his own uh, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> he picks his own nuts. <laughs> it's not long before we find our first ingredient. What we have here is uh, what is known as, as pied bleu. Uh, wild mushrooms translates as blue feet. I love it. I love the fact that, you know, they're not coming out of a box. We're going to get them ourselves. <laughs> pied bleu, when they're in season, uh, you know, we also get them in the restaurants. It can be very expensive. Um, you know, they're very fragile. They're going to be treated with a lot of respect. Uh, but I've never picked them out in the fresh like this. Wonderful. <laughs> I've never seen Pierre Bleu this big before. This is like a, a chef's a natural uh, candy store. <laughs> Prendre les deux ou tu laisses? Ouais, ouais, deux. Wow. Parce qu'après, si on en laisse un, euh, les... il ouais, y en a qui vont voir qu'il y en a, et après, ils connaissent la tâche et ils viennent. Ah, d'accord. Ouais, tout faut, on ouais, caché. Fois, voilà. Next on Norbert's list is nettles. 
something that's making a return to high-end restaurant menus. <laughs> he says that, look, if you, if you take it like this, oh yeah, no, it doesn't sting uh, as, as Nita would, and... Uh, Liar. Is she piqué ou? Ouais, voilà, on est pas les couilles. Là. Ah, okay. Ah, shit. Up here in the mountains, there's not much choice for for green vegetables, and this is a great source of protein and minerals. Ah. Norbert has a small veg patch where we harvest some onions, chards and leeks for our soup. But this is France and there's always dessert. Norbert has spotted what we need to make a fruit compote. What we have here is a very old uh, wild pear trees. You see them, they're minuscule, absolutely adorable. They're really quite solid little pears. Out of curiosity, I can't help myself, I've got to try one. Well, now we know why they're still on the tree. <laughs> voilà. Okay, I'm ready to ride back. <laughs> Only someone stupid from the city will come and slap the back of a donkey so it runs off like that. Prep takes me back to my commie chef days. Wash, chop and chuck in a pot. There's no actual meat going in this dish, but what we do have that's going to provide that protein are our blue feet mushrooms, the pure blue mushrooms. Despite my misgivings about the pears, we're chopping them up to make some compote along with some wild apples Norbert found a few days ago. And there's one final thing to enhance the flavour, juniper berries. Wow, really is, you know, it's going to be flavours of the mountains here. While Norbert tends to the nettle soup, I add the pure blue mushrooms or bluets to some sweated onions and garlic. What we have here is some dried cumin, which grows naturally uh, around the land here. And I've always associated that with more, you know, uh, uh, Asian cooking. I'm not hesitating to add it because it's actually come from the same area. They've grown in the same woods here. That will be delicious. Look at that. Look at that. Van Jun into the mushrooms. While that's cooking, we turn our attention to the fruit compote. Now we've got the apples and the pears uh, stewing down to this very thick uh, compote. Amazing, the smells that's coming from, from the stovetop right now. Okay, so now it's ready. Some brown sugar. Norbert doesn't do things conventionally. We're eating our dessert first. But there's one last touch to flambe it. I, I'd really like to see him pour that <laughs> into this. <laughs> I can imagine when you're on your tenth shot of, of this, it gets a bit difficult to, to pour. Oui, je pense. Il y a plus, déjà pas tout. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, come on, catch it all. Wow. The alcohol we're using is made from the macerated roots of wild gentian, a plant that grows all over the mountains here. I've never tasted anything quite like it. You've got this very strong alcohol, uh, which has had a very strong uh, spice uh, a note to it. It's the first thing you taste. And then comes the caramelization that you get with apples as you would in a, in a tatin. Um, and then you get the very strong apple and pear compote underneath and finishing on even more notes of the juniper uh, that we added to it. All right, that's the Jura. The nettle soup with mushrooms is ready. 
This is a wonderful, wonderful tasting soup. It is absolutely delicious, the perfect light dish, yet still very filling for a winter's evening. Um, it's got all the flavors of the terroir. You've got the, the, the nettle, you get wonderful nettle in there. Uh, the addition of, of the mushrooms, sort of very similar to, to a bouillon or, or a consomme like, or as you have in you know, Asian soups uh, with that wonderful flavorsome stock. It's what you have here. But instead of the, the saltiness uh, that you would get in the Asian soup, you have very earthy flavors coming through and little hints of, of that cumin. This is a delight to eat. What I've learned uh, on, on, on this particular part of, of my journey is, is that uh, the amazing fact that someone can still live and try and live sustainably uh, out here. And for me, here now uh, in the mountains, tasting this, everything comes together. I came here to meet the people who make the produce that the rest of us take for granted. But I feel I've done much more than that. My mother-in-law was right. I've started to feel like I belong in the Jura. My life in, in London couldn't be any more different to, to the day I've spent with Norbert here. You have everything you could wish for in, in the city, in the kitchen that I work in. But to be out in this natural world, to be able to go and get what I want when I need it, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's a sense of freedom almost. I tend to think we take too much for granted, you know, what we have on our doorstep. If you come out here and you look at the amazing life that you can live here, the simplicity of it, you appreciate so much more what nature has to offer. Wow. And, uh, you know, you could be a chef in the kitchen and cook and experiment on adding this and, and adding that. And you get, you come out here and actually realize uh, the best things that go together, you know, are the things that actually grow together. It's just amazing, an absolutely humbling experience. Absolutely. You know, I just needed to pack my daughter and husband up who would move out this way. But could I live like this uh, day in and day out? I don't know, so that'll be the test of time, I think. It really would be. But so far, from what I've seen and experienced, I could do a bit more of this. I think I need a bit more of this. Next time, Rick Stein goes in search of the ingredients revolutionizing Australian food. That's gorgeous. Wow. I'm in love with abalone. This is in a class of its own. If you choose to steal my produce, I hope you choke. <laughs> And more foodie adventures with a cook abroad on BBC iPlayer. Catch up with the series so far. Here on BBC Two Next, we're popping along to Vic's new tattoo and Botox parlour to get some work done in House of Fools. 